Oh, and, and Betsy was saying that she's on her phone while she's um, Zooming from work. I'm just glad you're, you know, able to listen. Yeah, and, and work scheduling is everything. We totally get it. Um, hi, my name is Malika Albrecht, and I am the founding editor of Redheaded Stepchild. And today we are going to be celebrating poets from the Plague Papers. I am so excited for this reading. Uh, Robbie and Katie are here, and they will be really um, manning and organizing things so that we can have one reader after the next. Um, welcome. So, you know, I'm so glad y'all are here. I do want to point out to get uh, your copy, you can go to the link in the chat section. Katie put it up there for us. And um, I think I'm just going to turn it over to you guys because I know you have a, a seamless system and we get to see um, acrostic uh, pieces that have inspired these poems. And so I'm going to turn it over to Robbie and I will make you the spotlight. Thank you all so much for showing up. Happy to see you today uh, at our wall-to-wall -wall ecrastic poetry hour. Uh, our first reader, I'm happy to say, is Barbara Crooker, who has stolen an hour to be with us today from the care of her husband. Barbara is the author of nine books of poetry. Some Glad Morning Pit Poetry Series is her latest. Her work has appeared in many anthologies, including Commonwealth Contemporary Poetry on Pennsylvania, The Poetry of Presence, and Healing the Divide, Poems of Kinship and Compassion. Take it away, Barbara. Can somebody spotlight her? Because I don't know how. Thank you. Barbara, you're on mute. Okay, got it. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you for doing this. I'm wearing a Van Gogh t-shirt too. I just thought I'd point that out. <laughs> um, my first piece in the, in the collection is The Very Rich Hours of the Duke de Berry. And this is a monthly, uh, each, each month has a different picture. In January, the Duke and his entourage eat from gold plates under a red silk canopy. Even his words, a prosh, a prosh, are written in gold leaf. In the background, a white chateau, many towers and turrets, blue slate roof rises. In February, the rest of us warm our shins by a paltry fire as snow blankets the sheep pen, dovecoat, and beehives of straw. In the corner, pigeons bicker over stray seeds. It's March. The peasants tend sheep. Prune vines break sod with an iron plow, the usual in every kingdom. The rich have health care. The poor do not. April comes, the Aristos frolic on the lawn, which is the pale green of newly minted cash. Their clothing, satin and patterned velvet, drapes elegantly on the grass. The peasants swim barefast in the river. Now tis the merry month of May, and the nobles ride their milk-white steeds to gather flowers, grasses, leafy boughs to decorate the court. The peasants do not. Why bring your work home with you? We all make hay in June with scythes and pitchforks, reaping what we've sowed, but not keeping the coin. Then the corn is cut and the sheep are sheared in hot July. In August, a hunting party rides off with falcons on their wrists, while the peasants bring in the sheaves. Hallelujah. September finds us bent double picking grapes, loading them in panniers on mules or vats on, in the ox cart. My lady strolls in scar scarlet silks up the ramparts, while Gustav, in the foreground, has no underwear. A harvest moon rises. In October, scholars stroll in front of the Louvre. A peasant on an old nag tends the field, his harrow weighted down by a large rock. Another man broadcasts seed. The magpies and rooks rejoice. November means time to feed the pigs, knock down acorns to fatten them up. 
Later, they're butchered, cooked, and salted, conserved in ash. Hands hung in the rafters, drying. The blue stream in front of the chateau runs between the mountains like a dream of peace. And then December, when we hunt the boar with spears, swords, and a pack of dogs, blood all around. The keep and square towers of the chateau rise in alabaster splendor, always in the unapproachable distance. My second uh, poem is based on a painting of Henri Matisse called Harmony in Red in 1908. And I, I have an epigraph of the coat of Matisse's. When I got the color red, to be sure, I don't know. I find that all these things only because what they are to me when I see them all together with the color red. Time has stopped here. Just as Madame is paused, still rearranging oranges and lemons in her compote bowl. Only a faint pencil line demarks the border between table and wall, everything the same fabric, red of aged bricks, scrolled with blue arabesques and vases of flowers and fruits. Terracotta rolled from his brush with the heat of a wild beast, spilled from wall to table to floor. The room vibrates with blood. Outside the window frame, there's a green meadow dancing with marguerites and flowering trees. While inside the red room, it is still. The table is set, the clock has wound down. Nothing moves or breaks the spell except this hot liquid arterial spill. Finally, another um, painting by Matisse. I adore Matisse. Uh, Still Life with Aubergines, 1911. Challenged by a writer in Ireland to use the word aubergine in a poem I demurred, too fancy, too French. Americans are more earthy using eggplant, something hot and heavy you can hold in your palm. You can strip off its bruised black skin, let it slip into something more comfortable, a saute pan of bubbling oil. Let it meld into a melange with tomatoes, onions, zucchini, not courgette. Here in Matisse's oils, they lounge precariously in their satin slips, little odalisques of the table, almost sliding off the red cloth with its cream-colored curves. The room pulsates in patterns, floral motifs everywhere. The eye doesn't know where to look. Perspective is askew. We feel uneasy, off kilter. So let's put our feet back on solid ground and consider the eggplant. It could be bitter if not cooked properly, but salt it first, then simmer on low all afternoon, releasing its sweetness, reminding us how summer is fleeting reminding us our days in the sun are brief. Thank you. Our next reader is Jean Julian of South Portland, Maine. She's the co-winner of Reed Magazine's Edwin Markham Prize uh, in 2019, and the author of Like the O in Hope and two chapbooks. She's published poems in Comstock Review, Kakala, Poetry Quarterly, Nagatak River Review, and other journals. She reviews books for mainstream drag. And her, um, I'll put her, her uh, website in the chat when she starts to read. Thank you. Take it away. Thanks, Robbie. Icelandic Picnic on the Painting Icelandic Picnic by Luisa Matthias Daughter. Once I thought I'd go to Iceland. Why, they would ask those who would only picnic in conditions placid, 
perfect. Grass, croissants, bare ass lasses. Because of the insteads, I answer. Vast vistas instead of trees, sky green instead of black, summer's cool instead of sweltering, lava instead of sand. It's the instead that grabs us in Matthias Daughter's painting, a play on Manet's shady déjeuner with its dudes and nude cocooned in such lush forest. Instead, here, bundled up Icelandic picnickers, Lowell captain jacketed at home in untrammeled brilliant horizontals of sky and heathland. Look, these picnickers have no provisions other than color. At one with free form landscape, they gaze outside the frame, wondering what our dull galleried world could possibly offer. E. Staten instead. Our next reader is Marley Yeomans. Marley is the author of the Book of the Red King, published by Phoenicia Publishing of Montreal in 2019. And her latest novel is the wonderful uh, Cherish in the World of Wonders from Ignatius Press in San Francisco. I'll read my poem in the play papers first, and then I'll read another one that I thought was a little bit kindred. That first is the young wife's reply, and it's a reply to the husband's message in, from the Exeter book. Um, Exeter book is circa 970. The young wife's reply. Riddle of runes, safe hedged in my hand. Writings I cannot read, but now hide in heart's hold. I am the girl who gleams like an elf, glinting in light shafted glades of the wild lands. The one who has often and often watched from the walls as nightingales loose their dream songs, deepening the green of leaves. The one who is close clasped by the sibilant cry of the sea, bewitched called by the Christly wave-walking ships and white cats, who pines, who will listen to no lesser prince, who will skim the marine swells like a manx sheer water, angling, aiming in all haste toward your hand. I'll dare the salt, the drowned water world, for no jeweled hunting hawk or gem-collared hound, no horn-hilted sax or serpent hoard barrow, could compare with the prize of your presence, you rare in renown, mine and monarch among men. So he wanted her back and she wanted to go. Um, the next poem, I decided to do something medieval-ish. And at one time, a few years ago, I wrote seven poems having to do with the Annunciation for Phoenicia Publishing and they, they published this pretty little book, Annunciation, 16 Contemporary Poets Consider Mary, still in print. And this is one she didn't take for Annunciation. Um, the editor Beth Adams took a number, but not this one. And so I thought since it was neglected, I would read it. And it is about the medieval prayer nut, those weird little things that people would wear on their sashes, which were full of little scenes from the life of Christ. And this one's a blank verse poem, though it breaks off rather suddenly. The Annunciation carved in a medieval prayer nut. So small, you want to cup it in your hand and packed with tiny sculptures of the lives of Mary and her son. It would have hung upon a fine work sash or rosary, but now unlatched for passing eyes to see, must seldom be the spur for any prayer. Under the glass of a museum case, 
Gabriel lifts the lily scepter high and symbol of the father, while the bird begins its overshadowing above, beside the sun reminding disk of sun. The spirit of their words is all that joins these two, archangel and the seated girl, the greeting and response, unscroll and kiss, a pair of banners floating on the air. The complicated silken draperies of dress, the rivered ripples of her hair. How often did a Flemish eye long dust get lost in the sweet evidence of world, the virgin with medieval bed and book that formed an inner lid to hide this scene, her boy, all formal education done, career long chosen and his rise secure, the whole world crammed into his boxwood sphere, his brow encircled by a braided crown, stumbles. I'm speechless. Um, that was beautiful. And please send it somewhere. It shouldn't languish. I think it may have been somewhere, but I don't remember where. Oh, I keep a list. Otherwise, I'd never remember. Our next to last reader is Katie Porter, who is my right hand. Katie Porter has an MFA from Antioch Press in, in Los Angeles, and she has been writing and publishing for three decades, including three books and five chapbooks. Most recently, The Body at a Loss from Kevin Carey Press 2019 and Slow Unraveling of, Un of Living Ghosts from Inlandia Books 2020. A limited edition collaborative chapbook with Johnny Bender and illustrated by Steve Lou Lossing. Her poem, Miscarriage, is a past winner of the annual Poetry Prize from So to Speak, a feminist journal of language and art. Her poem, Administering My Dog's Cancer Therapy, I Think About My Sons, won the Gravity and Light Poetry Competition and appears in white ink, Poems on Mothers and mothers, Motherhood from Demeter Press. Twice nominated for the Pushcart Prize, her poems and essays have appeared in First Daily, Contrary, West Trestle, So to Speak, The Nervous Breakdown, Salon, the Manifestation, Lady Liberty Lit, Shark Reef, Zocalo Public Square, and elsewhere. She lives in inland Southern California with her family, where she runs Pomelion, a journal of poetry, and directs Inlandia Institute, a literary nonprofit. Learn more about her at home. Katie Porter, poet. Okay, I'm not quite sure about that but I'll put it in exactly as it is. Go ahead, Katie. Hey, Robbie, it's actually, it's katieporter.com. It's really simple, just my name. Um, okay. And that just reminds me, I, sh I should have sent you a much shorter bio. So thank you all. <laughs> um, and thank you to Robbie for bringing Poemelian this really special anthology. Um, it has been uh, it was a lifesaver at a time of the pandemic when we were all just thinking, what can we do? We'll go visit museums virtually. Um, so here, I'm, I'm going to read one poem that um, was written for Rattle's Ekphrastic Challenge after an image uh, that they shared that obviously didn't win, um, but I still like the poem. And then um, I'll read you my poem from the anthology, The Plague Papers. Bear with me. The door in the forest. Every forest has an entrance, even this. And I walked through that door once May you also witness this chance success. The way the mind flattens the landscape until it can be unrolled like a feather bed. 
child of the matted pine, wake up. Lichen child, feather child, ghost child, mine. The threshold is an illusion. Watch your step. The ever after jaws like a dream, swallows you, and like a remedy, dissolves you. Resolve to keep on walking. And this next poem was written more after a piece in NPR that led me to a museum um, than the museum itself. But the museum um, at the, what, I can't remember the name of the museum now, but it's in Missouri. Um, and I can send you, it's, the link is in the uh, journal. But penguins from the local zoo were allowed to visit this uh, museum. So you might notice I have a painting behind me, but I also have a penguin. Um, <laughs> So I'll share the image, but Robbie, I'm wearing your, my penguin today <laughs> in your honor. So here is the image and this is called Field Day. Missouri in the epigraph, Missouri penguins enjoy morning, morning of fine art at local museum, NPR. It's no surprise the penguins prefer Caravaggio to Monet his brooding, moody, chiaroscuro, tenebroso, more evocative, more relatable, coming as they do from such stark circumstances. No surprise they resent Impressionism's comparative optimism. It took a pandemic to earn them, them, earn them their break, and yet they go gallery to gallery in their dapper dress, observing without comment while we watch them from our screens as they think, who's the lucky duck now? So, thank you. And then it is my pleasure to introduce our last reader of uh, the afternoon, the evening. Um, that would be our editor, the esteemed editor of the Plague Papers, Robbie Nestor. She is the author of four books of poetry, the most recent being Narrow Bridge, available from Main Street Rag. And she has also edited three anthologies, all of them ekphrastic in their own way. The Plague Papers is the most recent of these and it is available at the po main Poem Union website, which is P-O-E-M-E-L-E-O-N dot M-E. And I'll put that in the chat momentarily. And you can also learn more about her and her work at uh, Robbie's website, which is robbynester.net, R-O-B-B-I-N-E-S-T-E-R. And with that, I would like to hand it back to Robbie. And thank you, Malika, for hosting us today. This was a lot of fun. Yes, thank you, Katie. And thank you, Malika, for uh, hosting us. This is, is fun. And um, I'm glad that we scheduled it. I'm going to start with one of my poems from the Plague Papers, which is The Demon Speaks. I decided we needed diversity, uh, which means not all paintings and sculpture. We needed some other kinds of museum objects. So I found a little museum called the Horniman Museum and uh, a particular mask spoke to me that uh, Katie will put up for you. Again, the poem is called The Demon Speaks after a Sri Lankan sickness mask from the Horniman Museum. I am Coruscania, anyone I touch falls lame. No one can defeat me least of all those fools with their drum and dance, their stupid wooden mask. It's nothing like me with its crooked grimace, eyes bulging like a frog's, ears like spoons. The shaman dips and dances, pretending to be me, his bulging belly bouncing and the mask, it makes them laugh. 
he mocks me. And the other demons crow and point. Even the patient grins when he should moan and weep. I'd lost my face. Another claimed it, stealing my voice, my name. My second poem, um, not in uh, the plague papers, is one of my favorite ekphrastics uh, that I did as a response to the ekphrastic reviews challenge um, to a painting uh, by John Rogers Cox called After Gray and Gold in 1940, painted in 1942. And it's called Apocalypse. Apocalypse. Here is the crossroads we've all come to under storm clouds piled high as granite, midwinter snow lending illusory depth to the flattest of territories. The wheat glows gold, fields neat as a pair of crustless sandwiches cut just so. All of nature in order, but about to break loose. This is the moment before it all unravels. The fences broken, the wheat trampled, burning, wild river of rain running red through the road. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna hand this back to our fearless leader, Malaika, and maybe people have questions or something, um, we'd be happy to answer, I, or at least I speak for myself when I say that. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all can unmute because I know that you would like to um, clap like I do. That was amazing. Y'all have curated this so seamlessly with the readings and the images. I just felt like that was the easiest Thursday I've ever had. That was beautiful. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. That was awesome. Right? Yeah. I want more of that. <laughs> Another hour, right? And, you know, I, I'm going to send the chat section to y'all too, because I don't want you to miss what everybody's saying here. Someone just wrote, just, Alan just wrote, just a wonderful reading. What ekphrastic talent. Um, Robbie, such great apocalyptic imagery and incredible. I need to revisit the plague papers again. Yes, Betsy, yes. And so I did was hoping that y'all would kind of talk about the process and how this arose. It sounded like Robbie came to you, Katie, with the idea. She did. Um, here, I'm going to let's see, do that. Um, Robbie did come to me with the idea. She had already been, I think it was cooking up the concept um, and starting to collect submissions toward an anthology that I think originally maybe was envisioned as a print anthology, but there are a lot of challenges. I mean, how could we have possibly gotten permissions right. for all of this art? So we were, I was just very happy to be able to collaborate again. Um, this was our second uh, collaboration, collaborative um, anthology based around art, ekphrastic art, um, or ekphrastic writing. The first one was Over the Moon, Birds, Bees, and Trees uh, on the work of one single artist, Beth Moon, and that was that was great. But Robbie, I don't know where Robbie initially got the idea for this, but the idea of visiting these virtual museums was kind of brilliant when we were all stuck at home. Well, I can tell you that when we were first ordered to stay inside about a year ago, um, I said to myself, oh crap, what am I going to do now? <laughs> so I like to go to art museums and obviously I couldn't do it anymore. So I said, huh, I'll bet you there's lots of museums online with wonderful things on them and not just museums, aquariums, zoos, all kinds of institutions. So I started to check that out and then I wrote 
at least one poem. Well, I had already written poems about some things that were in these museums without even knowing that they were. Um, and then I sent out um, a challenge and posted it and um, it took a long time. I mean, you know how it is when you send out for submissions and you get a million things from Friday that have absolutely nothing to do with the guidelines that you set. Um, so after uh, taking a little bit of abuse from irate people, um, I chose, I had a wealth of beautiful things to choose from and was so pleased to have learned of the work of many people I didn't know. Um, and now I hope I count many of them among my friends and uh, poets that, whose work I will follow um, for a long time. Uh, and it's led to at least one publication too in the next Pennsylvania anthology, I think so, um, because I am from Philadelphia originally. But um, it started with frustration and boredom and, um, and led to um, mutual frustration and boredom on the part of the, the poets uh, who sent me their work, I think, um, as well as a lot of wiggling to people that I knew um, and begging for stuff. And there was interest from a publisher, a print publisher, but I guess the challenges uh, made them decide against it. So does that sort of answer your question? of how I thought of it. Yes, that was fabulous. It was good to hear kind of how it um, morphed and how you came to the idea. And I love that um, the visiting the virtual museums. I mean, what a wonderful way to spend the time that we've had to, um, you know, navigate uh, since unprecedented times. And for so many of us that what a great project to kind of see come together. I really enjoyed the fact uh, and uh, Katie especially the penguins because seeing the penguins in the museum when you brought that up that was one of the highlights I, I had that on re repeat because it would just make me happy yeah, yeah. Uh, me too <laughs> so and, and I know um, like there's a lot of compliments for each uh, poet and is, is there a way that Katie and Robbie you can send that along the chat section when I send it to you because I don't want Marley or Barbara or anybody to miss some of the compliments because it's it's hard to multitask, read and uh, read your poem. And I want to make mm. sure everybody sees what people wrote there. Sure, you can, I don't know how to do that, but- you're... I just saved the chat, so we should oh, be good. good. Thank you, that's okay. perfect. That's perfect, thank you so much. Um, feel free to jump in if you have questions. I've glanced through the chat section just to make sure I didn't miss any questions that I didn't see that I had. So if you wanna to talk to specific poets or talk more about the process. Uh, and so on the online, so it became a better thing instead of doing a print anthology to do it the way y'all did, because that does allow that freedom of um, having the images linked in or showing them. I wanted to hear a little bit more about how Robbie came to Katie. Well, um, I had done a collaborative ekphrastic manuscript that has never found a home. Um, um, and, you know, that was very distressing and it still is, um, but, and I did another just of my ekphrastic poems with links because I wanted to, to get around the disaster that uh, I experienced with that first manuscript. And then I said, well, why shouldn't I be able to do the same with uh, a, an anthology? Um, so I decided that I was gonna treat it that way. And after I got the no from the publisher, I went back to Katie who I had asked to begin with uh, and said, well, looks like I've got a book and it's, you know, it's finished now. Um, it, all it needs is to be put together um, and put out there. So she gamely snapped it up and uh, created an amazing, when I first saw what she did, what, you know, just making this virtual museum out of it where you can just walk in and, and have all these people's work and, and the images and the museums themselves at your fingertips. I was just amazed. I, I was so delighted. 
I couldn't believe how lucky I was to have um, gotten this uh, for the book. It's almost better than what you originally would have hoped for. I, oh, yeah. I, you know, it's experiential. It's immersive. So that is just, uh, I loved hearing that story. Thank y'all for that. I would, and, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, how did you choose to order? You know, what process did you, you use for, for that out of curiosity? Well, um, I said, I hate anthologies that are alphabetical because they're so arbitrary, right? And when I've done them in the past, they haven't been uh, alphabetical usually. I think maybe the first one, no, it wasn't. I did uh, sections by the kind of, the first one was called The Liberal Media Made Me Do It. And it, it was a, um, it was about public media and Barbara had something in it. Um, I forget whether you had something in it, Katie. And did you have something in it, Marley? I forget. Yeah, you asked me for something. Yeah. So we had news. What was that? Such a long time ago. It, it seems like it. it. It wasn't all that long ago, I guess. But um, it a lot of water under the proverbial bridge, I suppose. A lot of pages under the printer. Um, and uh, I didn't want to do sections and I didn't do, want to do alphabetical. So I had, I went walking with my husband one day and I got this in the middle of walking down the avenue here. It just came to me. It has to be my, by museum and I can make the museums alphabetical, right? So I suppose it's still kind of arbitrary, but I like the way it turned out anyway. It, it makes it easy to go visit the museum with that section of poems. So I, I think that makes sense. That's a good way to do it. Yeah, and I didn't think it had ever been done before. So, yeah. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. Well, it was just amazing to hear all the different voices, to see the the, what inspired what that spark was and then just to hear the gorgeous readings I have to say a lot of the readings uh, that you know the poems that people chose and the way they read it was very hypnotic I really felt like going on a, on a journey that just luscious language it's so fabulous job picking out who would read tonight um, well I think um, that it was because Barbara hadn't had a chance to read at all so we weren't going to skip her we wanted to put her somewhere. And um, you pick Jean because yeah. of your, you teach her yoga class, which yeah. I'm happy to know you're a yoga person because I'm a yoga person too. And my first book was uh, a chap book about a sequence of Iyengar poses. So, so um, <laughs> yeah, uh, that was 2012 now. That's a long time ago. And, <laughs> and Marley, uh, encouraged me, found a publisher for me to send it to, and that's why it got published. Um, so I'm grateful for that. And I'm still doing Iyengar yoga. Uh, but the other folks, except for me and Katie, were affiliated, uh, or at least Marley was, and Jean, with you in North Carolina. So that's why, because um, it's really hard with a group like that to choose who's going to read. Yeah, it would be. It would be. Well, I feel like we really lucked out, but <laughs> I'm kind of biased. It's really hard, yeah, to pick at the several readings that, that I've done. And I could do a million more, but I'm going to move on to the next thing, which is my chapbook of chef poems, if that ever gets picked up at Rattle and, uh, or wherever else and my acrostic yeah, book. So when that happens, I'd like to come back and, and talk. Oh, please do, <laughs> that'd be great. Yeah, no, I've said I'm gonna keep doing this. People have been asking, and of course, I, you know, I, I've enjoyed it so much that so I'll keep doing it uh, as long as I'm not working on Thursday nights. Uh, but I, I just want to say, you know, thank y'all again so much. And Katie, thank you for taking over and making it like look, look very professional. <laughs> I love that. 
it's too bad I can't have you back every week. Um, and, and so I wanted to thank all the readers. It was just so amazing. And Jean said, thanks for, yeah, all together into each other's orbit. And that's the thing I was noticing too, Robbie, when you were talking about Marley helping with that first chat book and talking about your, you know, ongoing friendship with Katie, um, is our community and, and how fortunate and blessed we are to have each other. Um, not always the same group, but just that connections and, and how much it does really matter um, even more so now. And, uh, you know, like Barbara was saying, five months without seeing your partner, I just, you know, I can't imagine. And, and how uh, so many of us, I mean, Christy and I used to see each other weekly and it has been a year now. So someday, but I'm grateful for this. Yes, Jean, right. jump in. I just, I just have to mention that it's so interesting, Robbie, how um, we met each other in the late 70s at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and then went our separate ways and then just reconnected through another reading and then through this wonderful project of hers. So it was just amazing to um, have that come full circle sort of. So thanks, Robbie. Yeah, thanks, Jean. And I hope I'll get back someday to Western Massachusetts. And if I ever get to do book tours, which I have never done, um, one day, maybe. Jean, that's a very cool backstory. I like that. Yeah, I know. It's amazing. And yeah. uh, it, let, let me know anyone who has a book. I, you know, right now, I don't know my way around the bookstore world here that much, but there's a great literary community here. So if you do have a book to introduce and want to set up a reading, I can try to work with you to make contacts in Portland. That's a great idea. Jean. And, I, and I, yeah. my contact with Marley goes even further back. Um, I think I was 19 years old um, when Marley and I met at Holland's, Holland's College. And um, I'm a just, wild woman. What was that? I said if Robbie was a wild woman. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> and um, I got married on that campus, and Marley was at my wedding too. And I met my husband at the literary festival at Hollins, even though it's a women's college. And he was the most drunk that I've ever seen him then or since. <laughs> <laughs> This is definitely a good Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> you know, awesome. Well, thank you so very much. And we do have an open mic, and I would love to hear anybody who would like to share a poem just jump in. All right. Go for it, Christy. Okay. This is a new one. It's called, I Watched Her Eat a Poem on Zoom. Jaws sucked sweet joy over the dam of teeth. Salt scattered waves across tongue, rolled to the back of a wanton throat. Each morsel was brought forward again. All cards on the table, eyes grown skyward. A lover fed green olives into the open wonder of her mouth. Oh, Christy, you are going on a streak of writing. Thank you so much. That's Thanks. awesome. Have you announced your good news? Can we do that? Yes, you can. I wanted you to be the first one to announce it besides the people that I called. I want you to announce it. And yes, it does make me hungry. You announce it. You have every reason to say these words out loud. I have my first chat book accepted to finish the line press as of last week. And I was bouncing off the walls when I called Malika to tell her on Friday. <laughs> I'm so happy, so happy for you, so proud of you. And that is fabulous. And I'm so glad to hear you out say it out loud. Doesn't that feel good? It does feel good to say it out loud because I haven't said it out loud except to the people that already know me. So this is really cool. Yes, breathe that in. That's awesome. I'm uh -huh. so, I, it's just so awesome. And, and Christy has worked so hard this past year. So hard this past year. Forget this. Well, what else were we going to do locked up in the house? I might as well do something. <laughs> well, but you know, how productive. I mean, look at everybody yeah. here showing up for community and writing and 
supporting each other, getting published. I mean, these are all really productive things. Not that productivity was a necessary thing. I think survival was, you know, the bottom line. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but it's beautiful to be able to celebrate with you, Chris. Thanks. It really is. Would anybody else like to read? I'll read. Jump on in, Laura. Okay, I'll jump on in. This is fresh ink and it, it may get um, edited many times still, but it's called Perfume. I can still smell the air thick with the smoke of King Edwards. Cigars my grandfather smoked before one lung was lost, his larynx stolen. I remember the smoke, but not the sound of his voice before. He croaked warnings at us for climbing on the chestnut tree to reach the roof of the chicken coop, rotting beneath neat green shingles. Wow. Oh, that is very powerful. It's so vivid. It's interesting to start with such a olfactory uh, image that to me was very powerful. Yes. Jean just said, great, great portrait, Laura. Fabulous. <laughs> Yeah, don't toss that one out. It's always scary to read new ink, I think, because yes. we're still meeting them. You know, <laughs> you did great. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Would anybody else like to read? This is usually how our open. Oh, Jean, jump in. Yes. I, I'm, since Laura was brave enough to read a new one, I'll read a new one too. Shame. Once I was meant to compete with other youthful thespians. Mid recitation, mental block. Voice stopped. Complete humiliation. Pretending my faltering was the end, I fled to a bathroom stall, pent there, trembling like a rodeo bronc, hide wet, breath haltered by nerves, thinking I'd be sentenced to fear all my days, not spurred to brazen glory but ever snared in witless shame. Don't you yearn to finagle the freeing of your early self that wrangled Philly? Unbolt the gate, holler, git, and watch her gallop careless, undone, unsaddled, undimmed at being unfinished. Oh, Jean, fabulous. You had me at breath haltered by fear. That was gorgeous. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, you people are writing some fabulous stuff. This is inspiring. Thank y'all. Something. Thank I wouldn't yep. mind reading another. Yep. Um, Please I'm, do, really, Bobby. I'm really proud of this um, Aeolian harp um, folio um, that I have in volume six um, of the Aeolian harp series uh, by Glasslier. And um, this poem um, I'll read to you is the first in the book. It's called Second Daughter, and it's after an episode of the Netflix series, The Chef's Table. My mother cried. I was her second daughter, little better than a death. In India, no parties or celebrations welcome a girl child, only slam doors, impatient voices, but I come from a warrior clan. Our family compound looks down on broken shanties. Father said, I must be mindful of this accident of birth, must make a mark. I shout my name from every open window, demanding to be heard. To make my mother proud, I earned a law degree at Oxford married well, but still felt empty, alone in a far off country, until by chance, Parata cooking in a stranger's kitchen summoned me to India to learn to cook. My mother was angry. She said, a lawyer belongs in court. In her kitchen, I watched and listened and she could not deny me, taught me to feed the spirit with a handful of flour and oil, defined the rhythm of a meal 
fashioned out of onions and potatoes, garlic and cardamom, ingredients that with patience and a practiced hand release their flavors, become a symphony. I hear the murmur of the sauce as it thickens, the rattle of the stock pot, savor the scent of spices roasting in the skillet with a bit of oil. It taught me faith, sealing the pot of rice with a braid of dough, trusting each grain would soften and swell like a pearl yielding to the steam. At home in England, I spoke with everyone who looked familiar, taught them my mother's recipes. Soon enough, I welcomed guests as though they were God himself. Everyone knows my name. I owe this to my mother, to the women standing silent at the stove while I worked the front of the house, sharing the story of this food, this accident of birth. The guests begin as strangers, leave as friends. Back in the village, I unseal the locked gates, embracing every second daughter, drying her mother's tears, every birth worthy of a festival, a feast, fireworks lighting up the sky. Ooh, that's gorgeous. Whoa. I sent it to the chef, but I don't think she liked it. She didn't write me back. Oh, you never know. She might have liked it and still not written back. I can't imagine someone not liking that. It's very gorgeous. And now I'm hungry again, too. There was another poem that was making me hungry. <laughs> you go and watch the episodes if you have Netflix. Um, yeah. And I quoted her in quite a few places. Oh, that's, yeah, it's gorgeous. And just the lifting up of the second daughters, it was very beautiful. Thank you for reading it. I was, thank you. I was just so blown away by her. Yeah. That's another thing that's gorgeous about life is all the things that inspire, you know, from penguins in an art, you know, gallery or watching a cooking show or the paintings and the, um, the art objects that inspired these poems. I, I love that dialogue amongst people. The people in the world. Thank you so much for having us. It's been my pleasure. And we are at time. So if there's no one else that would like to read, I will tell you all, thank you all so very much. Be safe. And uh, I will post this video. So anybody who missed it, um, because there's a lot going on, can you can send a link to them. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Malika. My pleasure. Thank you. And Katie, good luck with your second one. She's got another one after this. Yeah, it's, it's different. It's a lot different. Okay. See you guys next time. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, Barbara.